Hi everyone and thank you for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Today it's a gear review and we're having a look at the 1000X Pro by Leashway Film and Television Equipment. So it's another Bowen mount light, but here's the point of difference. This is the strongest built Bowen mount light that I have ever come across. The entire body of the light is all aluminium. There's no plastic anywhere on it. Even the decorative covers, are aluminium. The light is bicolor, 500 watts of tungsten, 500 watts of daylight. It is weather resistant and it boasts DMX. All right, so before we get underway, a very big thank you to the guys at iledgear.com who supplied the equipment for us for today's review. And a very big thank you for your patience. I know it's been uh, three months waiting for me to do the review, but I've been incredibly busy. But anyway, here we are, it's finally getting reviewed. All right, so if you wanna buy this, iledgear.com is probably your best bet. All right, so what we're gonna do now is go through how much it costs, what you get for your money, and we'll cover the pros and cons at the same time, because a lot of things that would be considered pros can also be considered cons. All right, so the unit sells for about 2,000 US dollars. So as best as, as best I can figure it, that's about 2,850 Australian dollars, somewhere around that price point. All right, so what do you get for that? Well, first off, you get a road case. So it doesn't come in a bag, it comes in a solid road case. So this is our first pro or our first con. All right, so let's go through the pros first. This is the real deal. This is as solid as you're gonna get a road case. So this could transport the light anywhere in the world. Chances are it's gonna get there in one piece. The insides are beautifully custom cut to fit the lights and to fit the accessories. So nothing is gonna get damaged. All right, so let's go through the cons with this. What if you're not traveling around the world? What if you're just going from floor eight to floor 12 doing a corporate video? Well, this is a bit bulky and a bit heavy. So a few issues. The carry handles are only at the sides. There's no carry handle on the top. So you need both hands to lift it. Uh, it doesn't have any wheels on it. So unless you've got a trolley or something like that to transport it, this could be your first con. But in terms of value for money, having this included in the price is very generous. All right, so let's start going over what you get starting with the light. And uh, it comes with a cap to protect the COB. And seriously, this is the best built COB light I have ever come across. Um, almost everything is aluminium in terms of the construction. The only exceptions really are the cap here protecting the back and the glass cover over the top of the COB. Everything else is metallic or aluminium, even the uh, lock off handle here. Um, that's not plastic, that's alloy. All right, so in terms of mounting options, You've got a junior baby pin combination here. Now, the only reason I would utilize the baby pin is to take advantage of this hole here. So if you've got, say, a large modifier on and you're just using the, um, the junior pin, you might not be able to tilt the light because the uh, stirrup doesn't have a bend in it to accommodate a big modifier. And that's where uh, the baby pin and this hole could come in handy. So if you've got a combo stand like this with a spigot that sticks up, you can get a tilt. Now that's probably the only situation in which I would use the baby pin is so I can get a lot of tilt down or a lot of tilt up. Actually tilt up doesn't matter, it's the tilt down if you've got a big modifier on. Now in terms of accommodating a large modifier, the spigot connector here is all metal. The stirrups are solid metal and it has not one but two disc brake locks, which again are all metal, including ratchet handles. Now to show you just how strong the lock-offs are on this, I'm gonna do something very stupid. How's that? Doesn't even want to sag. Now in terms of the last couple of pros, it has a very tightly compacted bicolor array which gives you a nice point source regardless of the CCT you dial in. By the way, it's color tunable from 2,700 Kelvin to 6,500 Kelvin in 50 Kelvin increments. The unit is also weather resistant, which is a big plus for it. And in terms of its negatives, I've only really got two. 
um, the LED array doesn't stick forward of the mount like it does on some other units. So if you've got some existing dishes from other lights that are bower mount, the LEDs might sit too far back in the neck of the reflector and that can result in hot spots. And uh, the other negative I have is at 5,600 Kelvin and at 3,200 Kelvin, it's a little bit more magenta than I'd like it to be, but we'll talk about that later in the video. In the kit, you also get a remote control. Now the remote control is not too bad. It can actually operate all the functionality of the light and operate up to six lights. Now you might be thinking, I'm never gonna use the remote control. I'm gonna run the light over DMX. Now here's a reason to keep this handy. You can set the DMX address for your lights using the remote control. So it can be a little bit like a poor man's RDM. Now you get three cables in the kit. You get your Nutrix power lead. So that's got your regional connector at one end and a Nutrix power plug at the other. You get a DMX cable, five pin to five pin. And you get the five meter head lead, which connects the head lead to the controller box, which we'll talk about next. Now, before I talk about the control box, I almost forgot the reflector. Now, the reflector is a bit bigger than your standard reflector. We'll talk about that later. All right, now let's get onto the control box. All right, so the control box does look a little bit unwielding the first time you look at it. All right, so I'll just give you a quick uh, run through of the unit. So you've got the carry handle on top, which is why it looks so big, uh, in my opinion. On the one side here, you've got all your inputs and outputs and your uh, main on off switch. Uh, on the other side here, you've got your uh, control screen and your interface. And on the edges, you have your V-mount battery plates. All right, so let's go through uh, the negatives with this uh, straight away. Number one is it's not stand mountable, so it's gotta be on the ground. So. That means if you move the light, you've got to also move the, um, the control box. Not necessarily a big bummer, but it is a possible negative. And the next negative uh, for me with this being on the ground is to do with it being weather resistant. Now in terms of being weather resistant, you can see uh, all of the switch gear, all of the connectors, um, uh, weatherproof, all of the buttons and all of the knobs uh, also weatherproof. Now, um, in terms of the side of the unit, this is what worries me, the air vents. Now, in terms of it raining, um, you know, rain coming down won't get into those vents and hit anything that's conductive. But what concerns me is the rain that doesn't hit the controller, it's the rain that misses it. So I'm talking from 20 years of experience. So imagine this is on the ground and it's raining and this is cement and you've got rain coming down, hitting the ground and then splashing back up. So I reckon that could be a bit of a problem. That would be my main concern. So if I was using this uh, outside, uh, my personal preference would be to cover it. But if I need to uncover it to access the controls, it is weather resistant. So I know that it's protected in that sort of circumstance. So that is a plus. Now, while I've got it facing this way, I'll go over all of the connectors and the on off switches on this side because it does look a bit daunting. And I figure the reason it looks a bit daunting is because of all the wet weather protection it makes it look more complicated than it is. All right, so we'll start off connecting the light. So the head lead goes into there. That's pretty straightforward. And then we'll plug in our power, which goes into here. Okay, let's turn it on. Now the next two ports, that's your DMX, your five pin DMX. Okay, so in and out. Now this button here, I'm just gonna explain what that's for. All right, so when you turn the light on, it takes a little bit of time to fire up because the computer inside has to boot up. Now let's say you're working on something like an outdoor broadcast. You don't wanna wait for the boot up time to happen, but you don't wanna flatten your batteries leaving the light on all the time. Well, this button puts the, the unit into sleep mode. So it's still booted up, just everything's set to zero values, all right? So if you press it twice, it goes into sleep mode. So the display turns off, you're saving your batteries or you've got, uh, you're saving your power on your generator. If you wanna turn it back on in a hurry, press it again once so you don't have to wait for it to boot. Now, when it's in sleep mode, the button flashes. So you've got a reminder of why it's not turned on. Okay, this port here, is uh, 36 to 48 volts. So that's for running the light at full power off a battery pack. Now I don't have anything to test that port with. All right, now over here is your 
USB port, so that's for firmware updates. Now this button here is the switch between your AC to DC power if you're running the unit off batteries. Now if you've got the light set up to run off batteries, this button will be illuminated. All right, now if you're gonna run it off battery operation, it says in the instruction manual to make sure you turn off and disconnect your AC. Now I'm a bit con confused as to why that is because uh, when you switch over to DC, you have to press a button and separate the two systems anyway, but it's in the instruction manual, so I do as it says. All right, so just a V-mount on either side. Now, it won't run off 26 volt V-mounts. It will only run off 14.4 or 14.8 volt V-mounts. Now, at this point, this switch here does nothing because that's your AC switch. If you want to switch over to DC operation, you press the button here. Now it reboots and fires up. Now here's the thing, uh, on the display it says it's running at 100% brightness, but according to my meter readings, it's only running at 60% brightness off battery power. Now on this side of the control box is the user interface, and I'm not gonna go over it in any great detail because it's really straightforward. All right, you've got your one knob that controls uh, your parameters. So at the moment I've got the brightness selected. I'm in CCT mode, I'll just turn that up. And if I want to change my Kelvin, which is the next parameter, to change your parameters, you just press the button. And then you're onto the next parameter, which is now my CCT. So I can change the CCT very straightforward. You've also got an effects button here, so let's press that. Now I've got this thing uh, running in breathe as a special effect. The effects are not so crash hot. It's got 11 effects. It's got things like cop car. So you need to change gels over in front of it if you're gonna do cop car. Uh, lightning, things like that. The usual stuff you get on a bicolor light. But in terms of the effects, Things I don't like, all of the effects run to one CCT. So you can select your CCT for the effect. So things like television screen, instead of changing CCT, it's just the one CCT, okay? And other things I don't like with the effects is things like lightning, it doesn't have a trigger. So you can set the speed at which your lightning effect's happening, but you can't set the lightning effect to go off on a queue, which would be a really nice thing. Hopefully they adjust that. They adjust that in a firmware update into the future. The next button is DMX. So if you press that down, uh, you can set your DMX address and you can also set wireless DMX on and off. All right, so don't get your hopes up here. So it's got two antennas on it. Yes, it does have built-in wireless DMX, but it is not CRMX or Lumen Radio. It's um, Leashway's own wireless DMX system. So if you buy one of their wireless DMX boxes, feed a signal into that, it'll talk to this. Now the next button across is your fan speed selector. So you've got a choice of auto, low, medium, and high. Now the fan on this isn't what I'd call silent, but it's very quiet compared to other lights in this class. So compared to say a Forza 500, 600X, uh, even the Forza 720s, it's on a par with those fans. Now in terms of fan noise, the controller here has no fan in it. It is passively cooled, so it runs 100% quiet. All right, the next button down is your address button. So that's for your phone app. So when you press on that button, two QR codes come up on the screen. So anyone who's using the light can download the phone app. Now that's as far as I got because everything at that point came up in Chinese and I didn't want to click on anything that I can't read. Maybe that's just me. And the last button on the main part of the controller is language, so I'm going to stay clear of that. Now over here in the corner you do have a wireless DMX on off button, but I don't have their transmitter to test that. Now the last thing in the box is a little bag full of bits and pieces. So you get a safety chain or a safety wire for your rigging. You get some spare glass fuses, which you'll probably never use. And I thought this was a bit weird at first, but you get an Allen key. Then I put a bit more thought into it. Because this thing is all aluminium, it's all metal, it'll probably expand and contract over the years that you're using it. So it might pay to check every now and then that it, all the screws are still tight. Okay, let's have a look at how this light performs with no modifier, with its dish, and with other bow mount accessories that I have. Now this manufacturer does have its own spotlight and its own Fresnel, and their spotlight mount looks like a very serious piece of kit, but I don't have access to these for testing today. With no modifier on, you get a huge even spread. 
and regardless of your CCT, you get very crisp shadows. All right, let's have a chat about the reflector that is supplied with the light. And as you can see, compared to a standard bow mount reflector, it's quite large. Now, a lot of that is to do with the amount of catchment area. Now, with these smaller reflectors, you get a lot of stray light coming off the beam. So a lot of light doesn't hit the reflector and is just wasted. Whereas with this reflector, that otherwise stray light is hitting the reflector and is thrown forwards. So the two big differences are minimal stray light off this reflector and a huge amount of light output. In fact, it magnifies the light coming off the COB by over five times. As you can see, there's very minimal spill off this reflector. Now the beam's not perfectly even. There is a little bit of a dull spot in the center, but overall, it's pretty impressive. The shadows are not awesome, but they're what you would expect from a standard faceted dish. Next, I thought I'd test the light out with softbox modifiers. Starting off with the largest modifier that I have, the Light Dome 150. This light easily takes the weight of this massive modifier. There is absolutely zero warping or distortion in the stirrup. And despite having a recessed COB, it seems to do a good job of lighting up the inside of the modifier. This is the front of the softbox with no baffled, and it's pretty evenly lit. To be sure, I then tried a lantern, and that was very evenly lit. Next, I tried the Nanlite FL206 Fresnel, and you'd swear by looking at it that this combination was made for each other. This combination gives you a nice even beam with minimal hotspot. It barn door cuts pretty much like it does on a Forza 500. Regardless of the CCT that you have dialed in. However, the shadows are dull. Now I know a lot of you are gonna ask about the Aperture F10 Fresnel, and that doesn't make it onto this light. The back of the F10 hits the body of the light and stops it from mounting to the receiver. Next, I tried the Nanlite projection attachment, and depending on what you're trying to project, this combination is either really good or extremely bad. Using it to create a spotlight effect, it's not too bad at all. But upon close inspection, there is some weird rainbow patterning happening around the outside of the beam. Sharp blade cuts work surprisingly well with this combination. However, if you defocus it, you start getting this weird rainbow pattern again. Fine linear gobos look like absolute crap. However, complex gobo patterns project really well, even upon close inspection. And the complex patterns have quite a lot of defocusing range. And this is all regardless of the CCT you have projected. Circular patterns also project very well. Upon close inspection, you can see there is some color fraying. And right towards the edge of the beam, the color fraying does have that rainbow effect. Coarse linear gobos come up okay. But when you defocus them, you do get a rather weird effect. Now let's have a look at how the light performs going through the aperture spotlight mount. If you're using it for a spotlight effect, it looks okay from a distance, but from any close distance, you can see that it's very splotchy. Even with the focus set to the cutter blades, you can make out the emitter pattern in the overall beam. With gobo projections, the blacks are very milky, and with straight linear patterns, there's a lot of concaving. And you have minimum focusing range before you start seeing the LED emitters. With circular patterns, the difference in focus across the beam is highly exaggerated. Complex patterns look okay, but the blacks are very milky, and you don't have a large amount of range for focusing and defocusing before you start seeing the emitter array. All right, now let's take a look at how the light runs over DMX. All right, so one thing to point out, it does have its own built-in wireless DMX system, but it is not Lumen Radio. It is a brand-specific wireless system. So 
how I'm testing it today is I have a Lumen radio receiver plugged into the light running off the USB port. Now, it does have great smoothing in it. So if you're operating it manually, you can do adjustments if you're recording a rehearsal, for example, and you need to make that fine tune, you can make that adjustment without the light shimmering and your actor having an epileptic seizure. All right, so one thing to note, it does have only one DMX profile. Channel one is your brightness, channel two is your CCT. It's just a basic 8-bit profile. Let's take a look. Now to give you something to compare the response times to, I have a Titan tube running off CRMX. Both lights will be receiving their commands at the same time. Let's start off with instant on-off commands. Now let's have a look at programmed five second fades. Now let's have a look at two and a half second programmed fades. Now let's have a look at one second programmed fades. Now half second programmed fades. Now let's have a look at CCT changes. We're going to switch between 3200 Kelvin and 5600 Kelvin. Now we're going to do five second CCT transitions. Now we're going to do two and a half second program transitions. Now we're going to do one second programmed transitions. And my final test, half second transitions. Now let's start going through the data I've collected, starting with the AC power draw. The maximum power draw recorded over two days of testing was 573 watt. At 3200 Kelvin, the light is pulling 573 watt. Set to 4,400 Kelvin, the light is pulling 552 Watt. And set to 5,600 Kelvin, the light is pulling 564 Watt. Now let's take a look at the brightness readings with the light at a distance of 3 meters, set at 3,200 Kelvin. The readings were taken at an ISO of 400 with a 1 50th of a second shutter speed set to 25 frames per second. With no modifier on, the light came in at 1,960 lux, which works out at f5.6 and 6 tenths. With a reflector on, the light comes in at 10,600 lux, which works out to f16. At 5,600 Kelvin, at a distance of 3 meters, with no modifier on, the light came in at 2,210 lux, which works out to f5.6 and 8 tenths. And with the reflector on, you get over five times as much light, 11,700 lux, or f16 and 2 tenths. 
These are the spectrometer results at 3200 Kelvin and at 5600 Kelvin with and without the reflector. At 3200 Kelvin, there is almost no difference. But with the light set to a CCT of 5600, there is a drop of 300 Kelvin with the reflector. Now let's take a look at how accurately this light dials in its CCTs. Between 2,700 Kelvin and 3,000 Kelvin, the light is out by an average of plus 28 Kelvin. Between 3,050 Kelvin to 4,000 Kelvin, the light is out by an average of plus 55 Kelvin. Between 4,050 Kelvin to 5,000 Kelvin, the light is out by an average of plus or minus 37 Kelvin. Between 5,050 Kelvin to 6,000 Kelvin, the light is accurate to an average of plus or minus 24 Kelvin. And from 6,050 Kelvin onwards, the light is out by an average of only plus 20 Kelvin. Now let's take a look at our average TM30 color vector scores. Between 2,700 Kelvin and 3,000 Kelvin, it averages 92.1. Between 3,050 Kelvin to 4,000 Kelvin, it comes in with an average 92.9. Between 4,050 Kelvin to 5,000 Kelvin, it scores a constant 93. Between 5,050 Kelvin to 6,000 Kelvin, it has an average of 92.6. And from 6,050 Kelvin onwards, it scores a 92. Now let's take a look at where the white point sits with this light at various Kelvins. Because this is a bicolor light, it doesn't track the Planckian curve, and instead tracks in a straight line between its highest Kelvin and its lowest Kelvin. At its lowest Kelvin of 2700, it comes in with a delta UV of plus 0.0016. At its maximum CCT of 6500 Kelvin, it is below the Planckian curve with a delta UV of minus 0.0045. Because of this, the light is tracking heavily below the Planckian curve which means overall the light has a magenta hue, particularly at our key Kelvins, 3200 Kelvin and at 5600 Kelvin. To give you some idea of these numbers, a delta UV of 0.0024 is roughly the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. All right, let's take a closer look at some of the Kelvins now, starting off with the lowest Kelvin that we can dial in. When I dialed in 2700 Kelvin, I got 2730. The TM30 color vector scores were 91% average color accuracy with an average 96% color saturation. These are the CRI scores and R9 and R12 are below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0016, which would make the light slightly green to less than the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3242 with an SSI score of 82. The TM30 color vector results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0035, which would make the light slightly magenta to somewhere between a 1 8 and a 1 quarter correction gel. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,355. The TM30 color vector results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R9 and R12 were below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0061, which makes the light magenta at this point to roughly the equivalent of a 1 quarter plus a 1 8 correction gel, which is what you'd expect from a bicolor light at this point. When I dialed in 5600 Kelvin, I got 5612, with an SSI score of 73. The TM30 color vector results were 92% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R9 and R12 were below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0045, which would make the light magenta to roughly the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel from the Planckian curve and around a one quarter plus a one eighth gel from the daylight curve. When I dialed in the top Kelvin of 6,500, I got 6,510. The TM30 color vector results were 92% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores. R9 is only just below 90 and R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. 
and the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0020. Okay, so this is one of the effects called breathe because I'm at the end of the episode and I figure I can stop and breathe now. All right, so thank you very much for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. The next episode should be on the uh, Led Zepp 1x4 Punch, which is a very powerful matte light made by Exalux that has an improved controller now, which is very intuitive to use, and it also runs off a single V-mount battery. All right, thank you very much. See you next time.